Thank you and welcome, and I'm delighted that you chose to attend this session. Once upon a time, a long time ago, way back in the 20th century, <laughs> there came a revolutionary woman who changed everything. She transformed the way we think about life and liberty and the pursuit of our personal happiness. She was no shrinking violet, this woman. Some would even call her a diva, an assignation to which she would probably smile and nod at the brilliant mind that you had in thinking so. So she wrote books and lectured, and interest rose about her ideas all across the world. So many of her followers were devoted as if a member of the family. They hung on her every word, scribbling down bits of wisdom that flowed rapid fire from that fascinating mind. And she weighed in on most of the issues of the day, bringing forth her philosophy to meet the current exigencies, explaining her how her philosophy could answer almost every question. She said, that it's her way was the way, and really couldn't understand why everybody didn't see her truth as easily as she pronounced it. Indeed, she struggled to get along with other people, but perhaps she didn't really care, and thus people responded to her without ambivalence. <laughs> and her personality, however, notwithstanding, her insights survived misinterpretation and often downright hostility. A new movement was born. It lasted a long time and it's still ongoing. Those early days, though, had a, had a shift because unfortunately, she died. And her followers were bereft and had to regroup to figure out how to carry on. And so that she was no longer there to align her philosophy to the issues of the day, her supporters had to interpret her writings as best they could in order to keep the movement alive, to keep writing and persuading people and giving speeches, etc. So not surprisingly then, when new cultural events emerged post after she died, she obviously wasn't there to expound on them and to give her views on them. She was gone. And so her many followers took her words and carved them into stone. And this, unfortunately, led to a schism. Who got to say what the philosophical truth was? brought forth points of misunderstanding, hard feelings, and eventually that split. So now today, in the Montessori movement, there are two separate groups, <laughs> both believing that they have the authentic Montessori model. I see you laugh. You thought I was talking about objectivists, didn't you? <laughs> well, that too. I happened to be around when both of those happened simultaneously, and I always thought how similar they are. And indeed, throughout history, great, move, great movements have always, not always, but often evidenced a schism of some kind. Think about today the Sunni and Shia Muslims. If you understand their history, you say, they're fighting over that? And they, they had this schism and they turned to violence and that's still not healed, is it? Some other movements have had a schism, but they came back together. So think about maybe the American Civil War. <coughs> other great movements split and decided just to go their separate ways without violence, if you will. Unfortunately, often their numbers are smaller 
and they simply seem to accept that for whatever reason. So here we are, objectivists at the Atlas Summit, and as we know, down the coast, if soon ARI will be gathering with their side of the schism. So that being true, the question I pose today is what can we learn about ourselves being members of one great movement that's experienced a schism? How are we surviving and thriving post 25, those, these last 25 years and what's our plan for the future? I would, I would suggest that as Atlas Society members, we ought to be grateful for where we are. We look around at each other and see obje other objectivists here in our midst. And so we ask ourselves, what is it that brings us together? I would argue that we are here because we agree on the foundational principles of objectivism. We're inspired by the theories and insights of Ayn Rand, and as articulated by others as well, the founders of our country, not at the least. Man has a right to live, man is heroic, his purpose is happiness, his work is noble, and he accesses reason to achieve the above. Right, those are pretty much the foundational principles. So then, what does that mean as we attempt to apply them? So, for example, is there a difference between a right and the right thing to do? And then how does that manifest itself? Thinking about the foundational principles, we have rights endowed to us because we're a person, as then enshrined in our country's founding documents. We have a right to our autonomous self, and our liberty and the fruits of our labor. Those are natural rights, and they stand alone regardless of what anybody else is doing. They stand alone. And there's really, I mean, we could argue the details of that, but there's really no responsibility to others concomitant with those rights. Those are natural rights. But everything else, generally speaking, if you will, are part of a social compact. And they do come with responsibilities to the other. We decide how we want to live our life based on our philosophy. And then we have the responsibility to recognize the same rights and responsibilities in other people. This we do because it's a social compact. And we do this in order to live in a, civ in a civilized way with each other. Spontaneous order, if you will. I have to give you a sidebar. Yesterday morning, really early <laughs> at DIA, the Denver airport, we were in an intolerably long line to get through security. <laughs> and we're, oh, God, oh, God, I can't believe this long line. There's children, and they're screaming, and there's all of this chaos. It's really, it's really challenging to submit yourself to that, and then there's this long line. So I'm, I'm way back in the line, and behind me, I hear one of the officials there saying to somebody, you're going to have to ask permission of everybody in line. And what I got from that without even looking is this person needed to get through the line quickly. He or she had some problem. And so I was observing how that was going to take place, because there we all were. You can, 7 o'clock in the morning. So I watched her, and a few people behind me, she asked, she held out her itinerary and she was shaking. She obviously needed to get to her gate right now. And the people behind her said, yes, yes. But pretty soon we all heard her and we just let her go. Everybody stood back and let her move through. It was spontaneous order. It wasn't in our personal interest, but it was in the interest of the commons. And we, we did it happily. No one made a big deal out of it. It's just what you do. So that's an example of that spontaneous order that we choose every day in our lives. The alternative to these compacts, to these spoken or, un or unwritten, perhaps, niceties, if you will, is to live under the oppression of the monarch or the barbarism of the tribe. Witness America's streets this past year. 
Indeed, civilized behavior is but a thin veneer over the vast and deep pool of thuggery. And it's quickly unleashed in all its fury if we don't reason together and decide there are, so, there are social rules social for our social life in the commons out there together with each other. We are all that we have between living in peace and in that primitive brutality. Thus, when figuring out how to live with each other, especially with those whom we disagree, we need those agreements. We need those social compacts, contracts, agreements. Some, as I said, some are explicitly stated, others are inferred. But nevertheless, they're mutually agreed upon. And we each have this responsibility to ourself and to our contribution to a civilized society. And I would argue those are not mutually exclusive. We want to extend to, our, to others that which we expect for ourselves. For example, we agree to adju adjudicate disputes rather than shooting each other, <laughs> right? It's, it's one of the things we do. We respect other people's private property rather than taking what we want. And we en engage as free traders rather than, as Rand so eloquently put it, as moochers. And we owe that mutuality to each other. And in that social realm, among other qualities includes grace and courtesy. Now, grace and courtesy, I mentioned this to somebody the other day, and they said, you mean please and thank you? Well, yeah, that's part of it, but that minimizes its import. I think grace and courtesy is a lot more to it than ladies with doilies and men who tip their hat and please and thank you. These grace and courtesies are evidence of our ascription to that social contract that I respect you and you respect me as sovereigns who share, who share a common goal, and that's to engage as free traders in peace. That's what it takes. It's a choice. And we voluntarily associate in these different forums seeking mutual benefit. It could be at work could be with your neighbors, could be with your in-laws, <laughs> your schoolmates, your clubs, civic organizations, and other voluntary organizations. It's, it's how we congregate. And as we do gather, there's an implicit understanding that each of us comes to it with our own story, our own perceptions, our own interests, our own goals that we're going to get out of this arrangement. And so naturally, we are going to sometimes disagree on various issues. And it's most essential, therefore, that in these settings, we employ grace and courtesy. That is, that is, if our goal is to maintain and enhance a relationship, both with two people and a larger group. It's a different story if your goal is to invalidate the dissenter, the person who disagrees with you, then you act differently. You unleash your full fury, and the outcome, the consequence that we've all seen, is uncivilized for sure. But if one desires to continue the relationship, then grace and courtesy plays a significant role here. Nevertheless, it's not easy to be disappointed when somebody disagrees with you, especially somebody who you think shares a common vision or a common goal. And it's also challenging to, to live with someone you disagree with if you have to engage with them on a regular basis, like a co-worker or a person in your group. It's really hard to do that. And therein lies the rub for many objectivists, in my experience especially in the domain of social issues. Many objectivists, in my experience, have find it difficult to be graceful upon encountering someone with whom they disagree. This sometimes take the, takes the form of in-your-face rude behavior. And they would defend themselves and say, oh, it's only a debate, it's only my opinion. But they abuse the word debate 
Debate requires certain rules by which we conduct ourselves, by which we engage in that discourse. So the bigger question then is, why is it important for objectivists to offer grace and courtesy to each other? Well, a couple of reasons. It's important to us, not only because it's polite, if you will, or because it's that which we accrue to free traders everywhere. It's also important because we voluntarily associate with objectivists in that we, share, we have shared values. And it's those shared values that define us as objectivists. Man is heroic, we're free traders, capitalism is good, and benevolence is a major virtue, right? Those are what define us as objectivists. You're gonna say, yeah, well, there's more, of course. What about those social issues? What about the issues of abortion and gay marriage and raising children outside of marriage? Those are part of a discussion as well. And it is evident that we don't all agree on those social issues. And I would argue that's okay. I'm fine with that. Are you? Those cultural issues are not that which makes us objectivists, I would argue. It's how we apply objectivism to our lives based on our own story, our own perspective. Nevertheless, it's important when I look at you and you look at me, we each can say, I see an objectivist. I know you believe in the fundamentals of objectivism, as do I. And if we disagree, as we often do on those social issues, our mutual respect as objectivists will carry us over them. They won't hinder us from respecting each other. We agree that neither of us is disqualified from being an objectivist in the other person's eyes because of our views on social issues. But is that true? Do we? Who gets to decide what the orthodox objectivist philosophy is? Ayn Rand? She's not here. <laughs> Who then? Do objectivists have leave to shun anyone who doesn't hold down the line to every one of their hot button issues with the other? So is objectivism an open or closed system? I would argue that it's an open system, open to learning from each other and tolerating our differences. So this then leads us to how we engage with each other, especially those with whom we disagree. Could be in our writings. I don't know if you've been online, but some of the vitriol out there is shocking, isn't it? So what is our grace and courtesy in our online life? In our dealings with non-objectivists and in our dealings with each other here and elsewhere, in the more casual encounters and in the more formal ones. How do we treat each other? As I said a minute ago, debate is really essential, when we're, especially when you're dealing with challenging issues. You have to have a forum within which you deal with it. I don't know how many of you have um, partners, but it's, <laughs> You don't succeed very well if you just shout invectives at each other. If you've got a problem, you have to have a forum for within which you discuss it so that your frontal lobes are in charge, not your emotions. It's, uh, it's natural to have your emotions, your anger, your upset, your sad, whatever you are, but then if you're going to discuss it with your other, you have to use your frontal lobes, which is the problem-solving part of your brain. It's important that we as we agree to disagree, that we accept that reality. Not all of us are ever, ever going to agree on some of these. And so to deal with it, say, okay, that's true. 
and take it honorably. Understand that that's the way it is. And so again, there's an appropriate place and time for debate, as I said. I was a high school debate champion. And I learned many things from doing that. But one of the greatest things I learned was that as smart as I thought I was, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> and my debate opponent had ideas that had never occurred to me. And I had, it, actually, I had to think about what my opponent said. Oh, I had never thought of it that way. But my opponent was not shouting in my face. They were, we were in an appropriate forum for bringing forth these issues. It's a valuable lesson. So debate, however it's structured, is a great way to handle it. However, I would argue that random name calling, eye rolling, tongue clicking, sarcasm, shunning, derisive comments, and shouting have no place in any adult social encounter, let alone among objectivists. So to do so, one is merely a verbal bully. Now Barbara Brandon talks about this in her piece, Rage and Objectivism. It's a really interesting piece to read, and I want to quote to you from her. If you were a nasty bully when you discovered objectivism, the odds are that you're still a nasty bully. But you will have discovered an entire vocabulary that gives you an arsenal of weapons to use in your bullying that you did not have before. Such as the concept that ideas can be evil and that the consequences of certain ideas are self-evident. And she goes on to say that this is the problem, this behavior, this is an important piece. This is a problem that has caused many well-meaning people to turn away from objectivism after painful and humiliating encounters with moralizing objectivists, it thereby endangers the future acceptance of ideas that are important to all of us. Now, why aren't there 5,000 people here? So I stand before you, an objectivist, for a long time. And I also tell you that I hold traditional I hold by uh, culturally traditional mores. There, I admitted it. <laughs> and I'm also an objectivist who respects you if you hold culturally liberal ones. Hurrah, let's talk. So I call upon you to respect me and I respect you. And people like me, I mean, I don't know who else holds these views, I don't know. But I do hold accountable for their behavior, objectivists who employ derisive comments and attacks designed as questions in panel discussions and other formal sessions, for example. And when they don't like what they're hearing at a panel discussion on abortion, for example, they, without, instead of listening with respect, they make rude comments to the person next to them while the panelists are still speaking. And then get out, charging out, shouting invectives, or in all those other subtle ways that we disdain the other, that smile with clenched teeth, oh, what a ridiculous idea you have, how fast can I get away from you? What does that do? So if you recognize yourself or know someone who does any of this, you might ask yourself or that person, why are you doing that? Why are you choosing to insult someone? Now, as a sidebar, I've been reading Kristen Power's book, The Silencing. I don't know, it's been out recently. And she's, a, she's for sure a, a liberal. She's a self-admitted liberal, of course. But she speaks about the intolerance on the left and the non-acceptance of ideas that are outside of the orthodoxy, if you will. Liberals do this to each other all the time, especially in the academy. Maybe some of you have been at the effect of that. I have a personal experience with that. I was an adult undergrad back in the day. And I foolishly, I was in the social sciences department, and I foolishly took a course in women's studies, naively thinking I would learn something. 
Well, I chose to champion uh, equity feminists rather than gender feminists, and I got an F in the course. There was no movement. So reading Power's book puts in my face that sometimes objectivists act in a similar fashion. So I put the question to those of you or that engage in this behavior or, of course, present company not accepted, right? Accepted, none of us do this. But you know some people you have or you've been at the effect of it. What is your goal? As I said, when you're doing this to other objectivists, so you're trying to make yourself feel better, you're trying to act like the smartest person in the room, to marginalize someone, maybe you're trying to impress someone. What's the reason that you would do this? We're better than that. As I said, our cultural differences are not what define us. And if we really want to attract others to these life-affirming and freedom-affirming values, we best consider how we conduct ourselves and practice with each other. So I would argue for grace and courtesy as a strategy by which we engage with each other as a matter of principle and to extend to the others that which we expect for ourselves. Okay, so let's now talk about what grace and courtesy is. Is it really please and thank you? Well, no, it's part of it, but there's a lot more to it. There's a bigger picture to it that I'd love to share with you to help us get a hold of what this is. Grace and courtesy greases the wheels of social interaction, which is the social fabric of life. It permits us to go about our business in the commons without assault <laughs> and in our groups to engender camaraderie and common interest. In effect, grace and courtesy, grace and courtesy evidences our decision and our ability to ascribe to the social compact inherent in life in Western societies. Most of what we have to do in Western societies is self-governance. The police or the king or the boss or the thug or whatever is not around every corner. We have to figure out how to deal with each other. You know how you have to figure out how to let someone merge in traffic? No one's there telling you what to do. You have to do spontaneous order and just figure it out. Though that's, that's part of the social compact out there. So I, I work in the social sciences. I work with human development in the way humans interact with each other, the way society works, especially children and families in the American culture. And I've been applying objectivism to this work for a long time. And I do it specifically, it's applied objectivism. I don't have all of the answers that Will and David have so eloquently stated. I'm out there trying to figure out how to make it work in the world and my purpose in my work is to foster the autonomous lives in children growing into adulthood so that they become capable of self-governance. That's where my little sweet spot is. So I want to share with you a little bit about Dr. Montessori, who she was. And I shared a little bit about her story earlier. But basically, she was a human developmentalist who applied her insights into a revolutionary educational pedagogy, which, by the way, Ayn Rand admired, which is how I found Montessori in the first place. I didn't any idea what that was. And I read Rand as a teenager, and I said, what's that? Montessori said that the person actually constructs himself, starting in his earliest days, taking the raw material he comes into the world with, and then mixing it with the influences around him to literally create the person he's become. She was a constructivist, a cognitive theorist, if you will. So our, our, our goal as adults with this child in regard to this child, whether we're a teacher or a parent or an aunt or a neighbor, whomever we are with these young children, is to be a guide, is to be a reference, is to be a resource to that child in becoming. Because remember, the child's the one doing the work. They're taking everything in. And they watch how we behave. So Dr. Montessori said that grace and courtesy is a fundamental approach in the way a civilized person leads, learns how to deal with each other. She said, quote, what is social life if not the solving of social problems, behaving properly and pursuing aims acceptable to all? It's active, not passive. 
So grace and courtesy then, because it's social, means it's learned. We come with the propensity, with the potential to be gracious, if you will, but we have to learn the how to with every succeeding stage of development, up, and in, up to and including throughout our adult lives. We have to learn how to do this. So you might ask yourself, who were my models? How did I learn it? Did I learn it well? Am I continuing to learn? What, what? So in the Montessori model, for example, we offer the lessons in grace and courtesy at the right time at each step along the way as the child's developing. And you can do this as parents and other adults who influence young people. And this is so that the, the child, the person, knows how to conduct himself and navigate himself through life. It's not because we're the adult and we're the boss. It's because we're the guide and the facilitator of this child's coming to autonomous self. And we're offering the child a chance to be free. And the way they get to be free is they learn how to control themselves. I'm not a whim worshiper. I'm not at the effect of the blowing winds out there and the, and the crowd and whatever. I can choose. And that's that learned skill. I can choose. I think the I can choose sentence, gives me goosers, is one of the most significant achievements of man. So. How does this happen? Someone was talking earlier today, said in so many sessions it's kind of conflating, but someone was talking about the, the creating of the concepts and the, or of concept, and I'm talking, and I am dovetailing on that and saying, okay, how does that happen? How, does we get, how do we get to the point of choosing? Well, it starts really early, really, really early in the home. And here's what happens with this, in, the social, in the social realm. It starts when the infant spends a lot of time looking at the face of an adult loved one, usually a parent. And what they're looking for is social, it's called social referencing. And they are looking to the other person to figure out, okay, now what am I supposed to do? Because it's learned. And it's learned through osmosis. There's not a lesson in all of this for young children. They're, they're with you. And so that's why face-to-face -face encounters with your young children are essential because that's how they're learning. And to do a real quick sidebar, uh, what we're finding now in the research is that young people um, into their teens are having trouble interpreting another's face because they're not getting enough face-to-face -face time because guess what we're doing? We're spending a lot of time like this and not enough like this in the early years. And so it, there's a consequence. And we're, we're making mistakes when we're trying to judge another person's face. We, we, we don't know so well what we used to know. So this child, this young child, then seeks social referencing. And so I, I have a, an example. I love this example. I, I was observing a dad and a toddler in the front yard of their house. And you know toddlers. They're now walking, and they're carrying something, and they're walking around like this, right? They're so happy to be upright, and being upright and using your hands no longer for mobility and rather than now we can use them as tool gathering devices is a triumph of man as well. And that's why the toddlers are walking around like this all the time. They're so happy. <laughs> so here's the toddler out in the grass with dad, and dad's mowing the lawn. I forget, I think he was raking leaves. And toddler was probably as far away as I am to Will. But the toddler was there sort of looking in the grass and looking at bugs and whatever. And dad's over here. And down the sidewalk, toddler's here, down the sidewalk comes a stranger with a dog. And to the dad, it was a neighbor. But to this toddler, who is this person with a big dog? And so the first thing the toddler did was look at dad. Is it OK for me to engage with this stranger and this dog? And all dad had to do was nod and smile. The child went right to the dog and the stranger and everything was fine. But th the point is, we have a propensity to learn those things. This toddler didn't say, is this a lesson that I'm supposed to look at you first? It's what we do naturally when we're young. We look to others to figure out how to do things. But even before we can speak, it happens really early. 
So now this boy goes to the Montessori school, and he's in the toddler community there. And so, as is often the case, there are three toddlers, and two of them are um, debating, debating, whose, whose is this? And they're tugging at it, and they're both saying, mine, right? You've seen this with toddlers? Mine, mine. And to do another quick sidebar on that, the reason they're doing this is they're working on individuation. What's mine and what's yours and what is the boundary of what's mine and where does yours begin? That's a whole other talk. But nevertheless, there's three of them there. Two of them are tugging at the one object. The third boy comes up to the first boy, looking at the second boy and says, that's his. And the first boy looks at the second boy and at the third boy and nods, drops it, and they move off and play together. I saw this. No adult was around. No one was telling them what to do. This is spontaneous social order at the toddler level because they were in a, an appropriate environment for it. So the point is, we, have an, we adults, we humans, have an inclination to get along. What we then need to learn after we've been in an environment that enhances that is how do we do that. And what's exciting about working with young children is that they are really, 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 really interested in learning those rules at a really early age, under six. What's the rule? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? Because now that they're upright, they're now engaging socially for the first time and they need lots of lessons. So in the Montessori environment, we offer lessons in grace and courtesy, very specific lessons on how to. And this came about because Dr. Montessori, back in the day when she was first starting her schools, was working with a, a group of, you could call them today, underprivileged children, and they needed lots of help with hygiene before she could even move into any of the academics, if you will. And so one day, she was giving all these casual lessons, how to wash your hands, how to fold your napkin, all kinds of things. And so one day, she was giving a casual lesson to some three-year-olds on how to blow the nose. And she didn't think much about it. Blow the nose, what's that? We all say, what? But for a three-year-old, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a wonder of the world. And after she gave this lesson, honest to God, they cheered and danced and, and, and sang her praises at three because they were so grateful that somebody saw my dignity and helped me learn to control myself, helped me learn to take care of myself, and then how to be a, a civilized person with my group. So here are some other grace and courtesy lessons we offer to young children. First one is how to wait one's turn, which teaches the freedom of self-control. How to ask to join in a conversation or an activity, which teaches respect for others. You don't get to just barge in and do that. You have to wait and ask how to interrupt when you absolutely have to. I don't think I did that perfectly yesterday, by the way when I interrupted you. I just thought about that last night. I oh, should not do that as well. So see, we're always learning how to even do it better, how to interrupt when it's necessary, how to say hello and goodbye. Another one that's really important is pushing in of one's chair. And you're going to say, what? But the pushing in of one's chair signals the end of an activity, and it restores the environment for the next person. And it says, I choose. I choose to take care of my business, whatever that is. A couple other ones are how to decline an invitation and how to resolve basic conflicts. We have a whole protocol with the young children about how to resolve basic conflicts. And the interesting thing about this is that the Montessori guide shows the children how to do it, tells them how to do it, and then says, let's practice. Because that's the most important piece is that you yourself learning it figure out, okay, now how, do, how am I supposed to do this? And so we have lots of time for practice. Okay, so then moving on to six through 12 year olds, this is an, era, an age when they're more interested in the social world. They've, they've, they've uh, mastered those fundamentals. Now they wanna know how am I supposed to be with my peers? How to shake hands, how to fight fair, how to deal with bullies and mean girls and what's the role of the bystander? How to walk in a group in public spaces? We don't get to take up the whole sidewalk, right? How to have a conversation with an acquaintance and a stranger? How to express yourself objectively, not just blurt out anything you think of in the first instance? 
how to enter and exit a bus, an elevator, any public space, how to remove one, when to remove one's hat, how to speak to elders, when to use and to put away your electronic devices, what are your online manners and responsibilities, when it's okay to use gross humor and when it's not. And generosity and benevolence is a part of life and then the next level of conflict resolution that we introduce to the elementary students. So then we move into, okay, then we move into adolescence and this is where we form our moral selves. We're propelling ourselves out of childhood and into adulthood and it takes that though the whole time. So what are some of the grace and courtesies we need to figure out at this time? Well, how to handle invitations that you think you best decline, like sex and stealing and vandalism and worse, because your peers, some peers will invite you to do that stuff. What do you do? How do you say no, if that's what you decide to do? How to talk to a person of the opposite sex? How to dance with a partner? How to behave in a hotel lobby and hallways when you arrive at the hotel at 10 o'clock at night with your sports team? If any of you have been on the other side of that wall, you know what that looks like. How to treat elders and younger children and those who need help. How to harness your passionate arguments into productive encounters. How to debate. And then way advanced conflict resolution. And have any of you, do any of you know who Lori Bugby is? Uh, Hannah Laura Bugby, for a long time, she had a camp called Camp Indicon. She's an objectivist. And her camp was to engender confidence and independence in older elementary students and young teens. It was a week camp in the summertime. And I was there working with her for, for some time. And one of the things, that, well, many of the things that she did, one was money, how to do money, how to, how to be, take risks that are appropriate. And the other one was that I thought was really fascinating is how to, how, to, how to resolve conflicts. And then how to, uh, one of the great things that I saw was how to dance. How do you actually do that? How do, not the dance itself, but how do you ask someone to dance? How do you have those engagements with each other at the peer level? So one more quick anecdote about, anecdote about teenagers. I was observing in a school in Texas not too long ago, and this was the, low, this was the um, upper elementary, which means they were about 12 years old. And there were these two students that were really excited about science, and they were moving from the science table to the books to the, whatever the animals were they were doing something with. And there was a friend that was standing over here sort of watching all of this. Now, adolescents don't care about internal order, or they don't care about external order anymore because they're interested in intellectual order. So stuff is usually a mess. <laughs> if you ever have a teenager, you know what their rooms look like. And that's because they don't care about that usually. So these two are moving all around and kind of bumping things, and the boy left his chair out. Now, he'd been in Montessori for a long time and knows that we push the chair in. Along comes his friend, walks by, pushes his chair in, and keeps going. And the boy that was doing the science experiment turned and looked at his friend and said, thank you. Like, that was a really triumphant moment of spontaneous order and grace and courtesy that we just do for each other as a matter of being there together. And then they went on and do what they, that they were doing. So then moving into adulthood, how, right? How do you do things? How do you be a good neighbor? How do you get along with your colleagues? How do you be a respectful and generous driver, as I mentioned earlier? How do you interact with groups in which one is a member? And by now, you should be able to do 400 level conflict management, both with the personal people and the people you associate with. We're always refining and learning new strategies to do this. So if we have these down as a grown up, we're gonna know what to do in any encounter. And so, again, it starts really early, but it's never too late to learn. But remember, it's a learned skill that takes practice. However, it only is going to work if you consider it of value, if you consider it important. All right, so let's say you have some of these grace and courtesies down, and now you want to persuade someone 
to your point of view? How do you do that? <laughs> well, here's some do's and don'ts. I, to be clear and redundant, I would argue that vo verbal bullying is not an effective technique of persuasion. <laughs> you look small, and as does your position. You, you minimize your position if you're shoving it down someone else's face. In fact, we will run from you as fast as we can to get away from you, even if your idea is valid, because you're acting like a jerk. We don't want to hear it. So really persuasive people share some qualities, regardless of the content of their argument. First and foremost, a persuasive person knows how to build rapport. That starts with you, the one who wants to persuade someone, and that you have to assume that the other person has a good motive, a good intent, that they're not the enemy. And further, not only do you believe that, but you express it, that the other person feels it. It's all in your attitude. You come to the other person as a free trader, I have an idea to share with you, or I have a point to make, but it's not, I'm, I'm gonna lecture you. So your responsibility as the one who seeks to persuade is to create the relationship. And you do that by being open and genuinely present in the moment. You invite that person to the relationship, even if it's a five minute relationship, it doesn't matter. It's still a relationship. Another strategy is persuasive people are likable in a genuine way. Not obsequious and fawning, but authentically genial. It comes from inside. I see you, you see me, and here we are. Isn't this great? That's, that's, that's that attitude. The persuasive people exude goodwill. Some attributes of that would include your posture, your smile, your firm handshake, looking the other person in the eye, and saying the person's name. Everybody likes to hear their name said. Tell the people, turn your, turn your name tag around so I can see your name and say it. So this is grace and courtesy for grown-ups. Persuasive people are also in service to the idea rather than self-focused. It's not about you. It's about finding common ground with the other person so watch out for the overuse of the pronoun I, either literally or in your perspective. The I know better than you attitude will, will, will kill your chances before you even begin. What else? You want to avoid phrases like, you should, you have to, you need to, you must, or the more obnoxious ones like, anyone can see that I'm right, <laughs> or all objectivists agree that. <laughs> Right, you've heard that one. Or the one that I personally loathe when someone's putting it in my face, shouting at me, that's a fallacy. I run as fast as I can away from someone who says that to me. So next, you want to acknowledge the other person's point of view. So when you're having a conversation, it's not about, it's, it's, it's about engagement. So you have to actively listen. And then the way you demonstrate you're actively listening is you say things like, so if I understand your position, it is, so you kind of rephrase it the best you can. Let me, let me see if I heard what you said. Or tell me more about your thinking, and then you rephrase what the person told you, which is telling you, telling that person that you're hearing that person. I'd like to learn more about your position on. But you have to really be genuinely interested. It doesn't work if you're not. Are you really interested in their perspective, or does your tone, your body language, and your statements telegraph a pejorative judgment disguised as a question? The, yeah. So next, another way to be persuasive is to paint a picture of your position and explain how you got there. Abstract dry lecturing and finger pointing rarely succeeds in changing anyone's mind, but personal stories often do. It permits the listener to identify with you, and that relatedness will engender willingness to hear what you have to say. And speaking of listening, what is active listening? It's not sitting there thinking about your grocery list or when you're going to stop talking so I can start talking again. It's actually being engaged with that person in that moment. 
And if you're not doing that, it's not really a discussion and you're just talking and talking and talking, waiting for the other person to stop speaking so you can say another point, that's a diatribe with a pause. That's not a conversation. So those successful conversations include back and forth, using each other's words, and using respect, following a point they made with one of your own and reflecting back. And even if you disagree with each other at the end of the conversation, okay, and, and if you're genuine, and you, you, if you're genuine, and even if you disagree, you're going to leave room for the person to consider your proposition. They may not say, God, you're right, I've been a fool. They may not do that right then, but they may go home later and think about your points if you express them intelligently and calmly and respectfully. And isn't that the goal? If you're wanting to persuade someone, isn't it offering them the opportunity to come to it on their own? Isn't it better when they say, boy, I have this new idea, and you just said, I just said that. And you say, cool. You don't even need to take credit for it. It doesn't matter. It's the idea, right? So when you're concluding your encounter of whatever length, it's a good idea to thank that person for their time, or that you really enjoyed the conversation or that you learned something too, and maybe even say what you learned. And then always, I recommend to be sure you say their name. So quickly, if you're thinking about, okay, I've got to move on, one, one point quickly. If you're thinking about making a change or that you're wanting to persuade someone, understand that there are a couple of stages. One is pre-contemplation, meaning I had no idea I needed to make this change. And the next step is contemplation, meaning I'll think about it but I'm not going to do anything about it. And then the next step is actually taking an action and then practice. So the most significant shift is from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Most people are stuck or they're in their position, and to move them to actually considering another point of view is the biggest step. And that's why you want to give lots of examples and lots of respect. So in the end, it's our office as, my, as objectivists to keep the goal in mind. So what, what is our goal? Why are we here? Why are you here as an objectivist? Is it to wipe out any dissenters and thus keep the philosophy pure as you see it? Or is it to learn something new and confab with other objectivists to educate and persuade and to change the world? Now Patrick Henry, in his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech, acknowledged that the forces marshaled against them were ferocious indeed. And yet he was steadfast in his belief that the Americans in the Americans' cause of changing the world. He said, the battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant and the active and the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we are base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Is that not objectivists out there dealing with the collective menace? Are we not descendants of Patrick Henry? Our work is out there. That's our higher purpose. Collectivists are our foes, not each other. Henry inspired all to his single-minded purpose while at the same time he was generous with his opponents. He said, but different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought too respectful to those gentlemen if entertaining, as I do, opinions of a character very opposite to theirs. I should speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. So each of us, all objectivists, have the right and the responsibility to engage fully, freely and without reserve, but yet to do so respectfully. Did you hear his language? That was not the language of a thug. That was a man who respected his opponent. So that is our office, to do that with both our foes and with each other. So let's marshal our resources to prevail over the enemy and not diminish our ranks and strength within fighting. Can we really afford to lessen our numbers? How is it that we're going to keep our numbers growing? So I would argue that there's room for objectivists, culturally, lib culturally liberal, culturally tradi traditionalist. And David Kelly, I think, says it really well when, in his uh, contested legacy of Ayn Rand. He says, objectivism is not a closed system of belief, and that we might actually learn something by talking to people we disagree with. 
On both counts, I said we should practice tolerance as a virtue, unquote. And so I would argue that that attitude begins here at home among objectivists. And we can't leave this discussion without a final comment from David Kelly as how we as the Atlas Society objectivists ought to behave. And he does this in Unrugged Individualism that calls, you know, talks about benevolence. Quote, in essence, I will argue benevolence is a commitment to engage with others, to participate in society in order to achieve the values de derivable from other human beings. This commitment is based on the belief that one's interests are not in conflict with others, but in basic harmony. It involves the expectation that one will, um, that one will be able to like, respect, enjoy the company of, or at least profit economically from exchanges with most of the people around one, that they will make a positive contribution to one's life. And it requires us to, he says, he goes on to say, it requires us to initiate certain actions to deal with each other in specific ways. As we will see, benevolence in this sense is not a product of a malevolent in a, in a view of the universe. It is an implication of the benevolent view as applied to society. So I'd like to do, before I get to questions, I'd like to do a postscript. And this again is from Barbara Brandon. And those of us, those of you, those of us who are so certain, what? Oh, she told me I, I'm, I'm, I'm done? Done, done? Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, never mind, I won't do that. Let's do questions right now. Excuse me, I beg your pardon. Okay, questions, I'm sorry. Anybody want to bring up discussions, questions, issues? I'm so sorry, I misheard you. Yes, sir. Donahue. Yes. Using your advice. That was a very uh, valuable uh, presentation, and I have more of a, an observation than a, a question. I especially enjoyed your opening, which was quite clever. And people might be interested to know that there is a, it's a rhetorical device uh, that has a formal name. It's called the garden path. You lead someone down the garden path, mm -hmm. creating certain assumptions, and then at some point there's a revelation or abrupt shift that forces the listener to reconsider everything he's heard before. And I learned this from humor scholars who apply it to jokes, and believe mm -hmm. it or not, there are humor scholars, yes. and you deployed the device very effectively. Thank you. Like I said, I learned it in high school as a debater. You have to learn all kinds of strategies, but thank you for that response. Yes, sir. Hey. Could, my name is Aiden. Um, could you elaborate on the importance of social referencing in objectivist epistemology? Can I elaborate on that? Yeah, you, you made a sort of reference on um, you look at other people and that's how you learn. Well, young children do when they're still forming their personality. Okay. Once we have it down, usually around by around six years old, we then start on the path of abstract thinking and we're able to start to make some of those decisions for ourselves. It's a developmental phase. So yeah, we don't come, we're not born with it. We're born with the propensity to think and to choose, but we have to learn it. We have to learn how to. And we learn that from experience with other people, looking at other people's actions. Well, other people that we them. love okay. is the most important, not the TV screen. We research a show and that doesn't count. So it face has to be look at persons that you respect and love. That, that shows you how to engage in a certain situation when you're little, usually mostly under six. Good question, though. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I'm so sorry I cut us short. Yes, sir. Just whether you will Shoot. be giving this lecture at the seminar down the road, perhaps, later on. Uh, no, I have not been invited to that session. So I, I, that was good. No. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, I've been a leader of objectivist groups, uh, uh, t two of them specifically, and um, I've been attending to a lot of objectivist groups, and I've seen where things can go like horribly wrong in the discussion. So when I started Arizona Objectivist, I decided I would talk about how I expected behavior yes. to be, yes. you know, that there would be no using the word mm -hmm. evil, there would be um, not calling people's ideas stupid, that, you know, we had to be respectful, no yes. yelling, and, you know, on the one hand, I felt bad that I felt I need to do this for adults, but on the other hand, it actually worked pretty well mm -hmm. um, when people knew <laughs> what the expectations yes. were, and so I was wondering what you thought of that approach. Oh, I love that approach. At Montessori, we call that preparing the environment. 
If you want a certain outcome, you have to do the work to prepare that which you want the outcome to be. You've done that a really beautiful job, Will, about setting up this whole session about how things should go the whole weekend, and we understand what the rules are because we all want to know. It's like when you go to a foreign country, you don't understand the rules. Somebody needs to help you. So yes, I totally support that. I'm sorry I can stick around or out at the door. Uh, we are out of time, so thank you for your attention this afternoon.